Good evening, Fellowship Church. All right, apologies, I've been doing a quick tune. Bless the Lord. So in the scriptures, Paul talks about leaven working through the whole batch of dough. Of course, he's referring to like one bad apple ruins can ruin the whole batch, right? It's what we uh, say sometimes. You get one bad apple. and So on the guitar, one bad string makes the whole thing sound terrible. <laughs> so it's kind of a principle. But the cool thing is uh, Paul also talked about working the good the good leaven through the dough as well. He, he talked about how the word of God influencing us and when we're an example in Christ, that that works through the entire body of Christ as well. And it strengthens the body. Amen. So it does work both ways. Bless the Lord. I'm glad to be here this evening. Amen. Thank you, Father. You know, it's a it's a privilege to worship you and to honor you, God. Yeah, a couple times I, I, I saw, I was just kind of reading through some movie plots or whatever. Uh, I don't know why. I was trying to look for something that was uh, spiritually um, edifying <laughs> and having a hard time. But, you know, some movies they talk about, uh, they have uh, people that worship gods. I was, I was also looking at um, an ancient civilization. I can't remember uh, which one, but... Just talking about um, uh, the difference between their gods and one of the founding legends of the culture. And it's actually about the, the Genesis flood, how every culture has like a flood legend, just about not quite the same. And I was talking about the difference between some of the gods of the Middle Eastern peoples and how some gods are very vengeful. You know, if you don't, we don't make sacrifices to them, then they'll take revenge on the people and uh, things like that. And God is really not like that. You see in Scripture that God God certainly chastises his people, and you'll see where he disciplined Israel. But, um, you know, when we worship false gods or we have other idols in our lives, it's not just that God is jealous, which he is, but it leads us into sin. It erodes our understanding of right and wrong. And so God commands what's best for us, and that's just because of who he is. He's a good God. And so worship is something we should do. It's, it's our rightful thing to do because of who God is. But it's also a privilege, amen? It's a privilege to come before him. He doesn't have to give us the time of day. And so, but we do thank uh, God this, uh, this evening that, God, you are with us. And you hear our worship, Father. Hallelujah. Blessing and honor, glory and power, they be into the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, they'll bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee will bow at your throne in worship. You will be exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom will not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Hallelujah. Blessing and honor, glory and power, they be into the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, they'll bow before the ancient of days. And every tongue in heaven and earth 
shall declare your glory. Every knee will bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom will not pass away, O oh ancient of days. Your kingdom, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days, for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing unto the ancient of days, oh, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth, all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days, for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing it to the ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power, they be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, they'll bow before you, ancient of days. Oh, yes, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee will bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted oh god and your kingdom will not pass away oh ancient of days and every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee will bow at your throne in worship, you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom will not pass away, O oh ancient of days. O oh ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. We'll sing into the ancient of days. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, oh, isn't he counselor, mighty God, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he? Son of God, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he? Yes, you are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, yes, you are, Prince of Peace, Son of God. Yes, you are, yes, you are, yes, 
you are wonderful wonderful oh yes you are counselor mighty god yes you are yes you are yes you are yes you are you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky Lord I lift your name on high you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Yes, you are beautiful, beautiful, oh yes you are, Prince of Peace, Son of God, yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a gracious Savior we have. And what a mighty God we serve. Amen. All right. Don't sound too excited or anything. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Father, we worship you tonight. We give you all glory, all glory. And it was your will to, to take the name of Jesus after he endured his suffering and was obedient even to the death of the cross, enduring having all the sins of the world for all time placed upon him so that your wrath could be poured out on sin on him in our place. And you raised him from the dead. Hmm. You raised him from the dead. And Jesus actually raised himself from the dead according to his own word as well. It's interesting. It's kind of a blurred line between Jesus and the Father both of them being God. <laughs> Bless the Lord. But therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. So, Father, as we begin our time of prayer, we just uh, we thank you that you hear our prayers, God. There is none other. There is no other Savior, no other God. You and you alone. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let's turn that microphone on. Uh -huh. yep. Good evening, everyone. That thing is sensitive, isn't it?
evening, everyone. I'm still Mark, Mark Paulus. A couple weeks away. Uh, if you've been following my weekly testimonies, <clears throat> where my daughter Sammy has been in the process of getting her two sons, Bryson and Ezekiel, back, getting, her, getting custody back of her kids. It's been about a year and a half. They've been in Richmond, and we've been jumping back and forth to visit with them. And they're back home now with their mom. And we've had a couple uh, little bumps in the road, lining up daycare. So I've been down there kind of pinch hinting, filling in for her while she's getting that lined up. And so anyway, I've been taking care of some family business. <clears throat> and along with that, my 23-year-young granddaughter, Kayla, just got back from a 10-day trip to Europe. She was over there with a couple of friends. They, she landed in Greenland, went over to Europe, went over to London, went from London to the Netherlands on the Adriatic Sea, went from there to Madrid, and then back. she came back home two nights ago. I picked her up at the Dulles Airport. And she was ready to be home. But she had a great time. I'm sure she did. And, and she'll have to take some time to explain some of the things that she did while she was having fun with all her friends. What else? Let's see. We're praying. My daughter, April, is getting back into working, praying for her physical health. And... Um, she has some needs, like a, she needs to get a car back. Kayla needs a car. Sammy needs a car. <laughs> and so, but anyway, God is providing in his time. I'm trying to think what else. Um, praying for, I've been communicating with Cindy Levering. I don't know if she's still on our prayer list. I don't see it by glancing on here, but Cindy Levering was the cellmate of my late daughter, Mary, at the Women's House of Corrections in Jessup. It's been a little bit over, about a year ago, well, Mary was released, and eight days later she passed away, keep a long story short. But Cindy is doing life without parole. Cindy has got a, an official request on the governor's desk asking for clemency and to be released. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how long she's been locked up. It's probably 20 years, give or take, a few. Uh, she confides in me that, that she's innocent of the crime. Whether she is or not, she's done a lot of time. And life without parole, that's pretty difficult. Especially, you know, those of us in free society, the majority of free society is not aware of the conditions in prisons. Out of sight, out of mind, and the jails. Life in jail is very difficult. It's overall, it's lonely, and in many, many ways, it's very difficult. Not to say it's not necessary. You find in the Bible that um, the Figures of, of law and, and authority are, are in place by God, and it is of necessity, but God is a merciful God. And we're praying for his mercy for Cindy Levering. Michelle Park is in her 30s. She's in another prison up in Delaware. I communicate with Michelle. She is also a friend of my late daughter, Mary. Uh, Michelle's doing okay, but she's got another couple of years left to do. She has a a son who was paralyzed in a car accident for which Michelle is incarcerated for, for manslaughter for the person that she hit and that they died of the injuries incurred in that. But Michelle, Cindy Levering and Michelle Park, they are both born again Christians. And Michelle, she's given it all she's got and plus, I mean, she's given it 300%. She's going to college, she's working in the kitchen. She's working as a counselor. And again, life in prison is very difficult and is a very difficult people to live with. 
of the prisoners. So we're praying for Michelle Park, Cindy Levering, and Cindy tells me about a young lady that I used to see in the visiting room by the name of Amanda Mikado, Amanda Mikado, and Cindy was just telling Amanda about corresponding with me, and Cindy was saying, well, Amanda was saying that she would like to correspond with me also, and I says, okay, I'd be glad to write to her and try to give her some words of encouragement. It's a little bit of difficulty in trying to find the specific information on Amanda so that I've got to have the commitment number and it's not showing up on the computer. And anyway, I'm just praying that I'll be able to uh, get that much straightened out to where I can communicate with Amanda. Amanda, again, she is young. I don't know what her charges is or what her length of sentence is, but I used to see her parents visiting her when I was visiting with my daughter, Mary. And I thought what a shame it was for such a young person to be there in a, in a state woman's prison, but she's still there. So, you know, if we have opportunity to minister to those who are in prison, jail, or recovery situations like Pastor Marvin and now there's a minister down here at the Jude House. You know, if you're not involved, support those who are, and it's, at least in some way. You know, if you hear somebody talk about they know somebody, pray for them. In some way, shape, or form, we should be ministering for those, again, out of sight, out of mind. You know, we're busy. We got lives to live. We got a lot of problems of our own. But those who are sitting in jail, they can't do a thing about their problems. With all the ambition in the world, they can't get out and try to find a job. They can't, well, they do have some opportunities, opportunities in some of the institutions, the education programs and so forth. But anyway, all that, and we also have, uh, I'm trying to think of another name that should be on here. Well, let's go through the list and see, uh, my brain is kind of locked up on his one name, but uh, that'll come back into mind if I don't see his name on the list. And I have to read through this list of our prayer list, so with, be patient with me. I got about 40 names to read, and we do pray that God, we know that he's calling us to prayer, and he is hearing, and we trust that he will answer. And I'm going to begin reading the list with Jalen Almond, Maddie Andrenson, Caleb Bailey, and Kay Caleb Bailey is... Um, He's incarcerated, I don't know how long, he's, but he's in a federal institution. We're praying for Caleb as well. Brandon Baldwin, uh, Carolyn Beeman, Gary and family, Jane, Jan Bice, Carol Bowie, Dana Brown, Jacob Burke, Helen and Rusty Cooper, Denise Carberson, uh, Ashley Enstrom and her sons Aiden and Emery. Faye Farmer, Curtis George, Gibbs, let's see, Bethany, Rick, Emily, and Ellie Gibson, or is it L or Ellie Gibson? David Gilroy, Linda Grady, Joan and Steve Hall Sr., Kimberly Harris, Tommy and Lisa Harrison family, Christopher Hidalgo, Mary Hoffman, Joseph Houston, Sarah Eisenhart, Joseph and Mary, uh, Joseph, comma, Kelly and family, Robin Keyes, Margaret King, Stan, Joe, and Dixie Kaczewski, Cindy Levering, there's her name, uh, Ken and Lorraine Mahan, the Melberg family, Jerry McCauley, Carolyn McConkey, Ellen Mary Jane Mills, Trudy Monroe, Jerry and Linda Muchel, uh, Eric Olson, Terry Price, Andy Rander, <coughs> excuse me, Owen Riley, Debbie Paul, and Samantha Roberts, the Santucci family, and while we're halfway through the list, we lift up Pastor Marvin Harris, been a little under the weather the last couple of days, and uh, he is doing much better today. I saw him this afternoon. He helped me again with my air conditioner, but uh, he didn't think he was quite up to coming into church today. 
But we're thanking God for his continued physical strength and um, spiritual encouragement that God gives him. I talk to people sometimes around town like I did this afternoon at the parts store. And they talk about Marvin Harris. He's always jovial and he's always got a story to tell and he sometimes brings you to tears. <laughs> but <clears throat> he's been a friend of mine for quite a while and everybody loves and knows Marvin. Moving right along, we're praying for Garnett and Brian Anderson, Terry Apperson, Ellsworth Baker, Dottie Bedell, Patty Barry and family, Debbie Booher, Catherine's, Catherine Birch's sister with cancer, Harry and Roxanne Burgers, Doris Chesser, Marissa Crown. Here's a tough name for me to pronounce. Degurulama, Degurulama, Don Agamanum, Cheryl Farr, pastor's daughter, and hallelujah, her house has been sold. Thank you, Jesus. That was quite a work in process. Randy and myself and a few others did some work back last October to get that thing ready for market, and there were some difficulties, but anyway, thank God that she's got that behind her. Uh, Sheila Farmer, Yvonne Gibson, Mary Gibson, Jesse Gilroy, Penny Griffith, Dory Hardesty, Jordan Hart and Baby, Dale Hay, Madeline Hoffer, Ed Horn, Tony Ensco, Vince James, Maria Jones and Chuck, son, her son Chuck Jones, Maddie Kelly, Doug King, Ginger and A.J. Conigan, Carrie Langley, Earl and Nellie Linder, Jeffrey Methel, Ella and Evan Mason, Kara McClure, Denise and Doug McElwee, Lau Moore, Mike Morris, Charles Newman and family, and again, as mentioned, Michelle Park, uh, Mrs. Purdy, Emily Remo, and all the Remo family, uh, Betty and Ray, and all of their children and grandchildren. Uh, let's see, Brian and Brooklyn and Tyler Roberts, Stephen Russell, Eleanor Sayers, and Pastor has a few write-ins, Carolyn Rander and Dan Bennett Preacher. I don't know if Preacher is his name or is this his job. Dan Bennett. A few left over here on other, other pages. Uh, Melissa Seacrest, Betty Stepp, Aiden Sweeney, T Tex and John, Lane Turner, Jerry Waverling, Bob Wen, Robbie and Madison Williams, John Winborn. Massey Shumpert was for surgery. Chris, <coughs> excuse me, Christian Stockman, Flick Taman, Rejoice Tenerife, uh, Glenda Verley's mother, Lilio, Geneva Wesley, Carla Whitley, Michelle Waddell, Krista, Crystal, and Ariel Younger. That's the end of the, of the list. We're also praying for is the country of Israel and the countries that are throughout the world that, that they would know the peace of God and to allow the Lord to work in their hearts to stop the persecution of Christians and Jews around the world. For those who are in the military, we're praying for Jacob Houston, Ashley Baldo, Brother Anthony Baldo, Billy Heath, Adam Corey, Charlie Burke, Brandon Hardesty, and more write-ins are Carolyn Birch, Sister Donna. So, with that, we come to, to prayer. Father, again, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to you. We, help, <clears throat> we ask, Lord, that you help us in spirit to focus in on you uh, genuinely and ask you to ask, answer the prayer request, though we don't know the specifics, and the majority of them you do 
We thank you, Lord, for your provisions, for healing, for healing of relationships. We thank you for your blessing on um, Fellowship Church and Southern Maryland Christian Academy uh, and all those who are involved in employment here. And we pray your blessing on our teacher tonight. <clears throat> tonight. And is, is that you, Justin? Justin's going to teach tonight. Praise the Lord. So God's blessing on you. In Jesus' name, amen. How's everybody doing tonight? Feel tired? Hot? It's very hot. Um, so, uh, Pastor Marvin asked me on Sunday, right before church, if I could preach tonight, and I said, yeah, that's good. I, I have a run-in list in my phone of just topics that I want to want to talk about, so given the chance to preach, I pulled that up, and I ended up kind of jumping around tonight, so uh, it should be just fine, but uh, just prepare yourself. <laughs> We're going to be a little all over the place, that's okay. But we have a common theme, so it's good. Um, so, as I was saying, there are themes that repeat throughout Scripture. Um, commonalities that unite the Old and New Testaments that show uh, that although it's split into the Old and New Testament, it is one united book. Uh, so there's a theme I want to talk about tonight, and I'm going to use several stories from the Bible to really uh, bring that home. These stories are <clears throat> what you'd call the big stories in the Bible, uh, stories that even people who are unfamiliar with the message of the Bible are at least aware of in some form of familiarity, whether it be kind of cultural osmosis, just hearing about it in pop culture and whatnot, or uh, maybe they went to vacation Bible school or church camp as a kid, but somehow the big events people know. Um, anyone have any uh, thoughts? What are some big stories in the Bible that you guys think that just people who aren't even familiar with it know, just off the top of your head? Well, I listen to Jay Byrne McGee teach on Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, <clears throat> and uh, the, the king, the young early king then was Josiah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a good king. There's one. David and Goliath. David and Goliath. We are talking about that a bit tonight. <coughs> Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. Jonah being swallowed in the whale. In the whale. That is another one. We're not talking about it tonight, but that is another one that most people are familiar with. Um, but anyways, so the common uniting theme tonight is just the, basically the phrase that all the earth may know. And it's just something I've noticed as I was reading through uh, various stories through Scripture. This is kind of a repeated thing. Like, when big events happen in Scripture, it, God does it so that people will know who He is. Right? Um, so, I'll be pulling from the books of Joshua, 1 Samuel, Daniel, Psalms, and uh, as well as the New Testament. Um, but first, I want to talk about the book of Joshua. It's an amazing book with two main themes. One, that God is faithful. He keeps His promises. And two... God is a God of victory. He's never lost a fight he's ever been in. Uh, so it's a very encouraging book to read through. Um, uh, but the story that I'm talking about, it says it takes place in Joshua 2, 3, and 4. And this is after God has taken the Israelites out of Egypt, after the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They're getting ready to enter and take the promised land. Now Joshua sends two spies into the city of Jericho. Now, this is different than the 12 spies that Moses sent in uh, years earlier. Um, Joshua sends two spies into the city of Jericho, and the whole city goes on high alert. Uh, apparently, news about what God had done to Egypt, a powerful nation, had spread as far as Jericho, and they knew the Israelites were coming uh, to them to take out their city. How do we know that? Because there's a lady in that city by the name of Rahab. She was a prostitute or harlot, as the King James calls her. Uh, she did end up repenting of that, got married, and was King David's great-great-grandmother. She was his ancestor. If you follow that to its conclusion, she's in the line of Christ as well. 
Um, so God saves and uses all kinds of people. Anyways, Rahab in Joshua 2, 9 through 11, tells the spies what's going on in the city. And this is verse 9. It says, And she said to, unto the men, I know that the Lord has, or hath given you the land, that the terror is fallen upon us, that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came up out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Notice she points out how God dried up the Red Sea. That's important for later. Uh, when God parted the Red Sea during the Exodus and really throughout the account of the Exodus, many of the signs and wonders, the plagues, uh, God said he did it that people may know that he is the Lord. Uh, first, the Israelites in Exodus uh, 6, verse 7, when he first calls Moses at the burning bush, he says, And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Then the Egyptians in chapter 17 and 14, this is a repeated phrase throughout the Exodus narrative. It says, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And then verse uh, chapter 14, right before the parting of the Red Sea, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So, in, and even, even way back when, when uh, Moses first stood before Pharaoh and said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice? God made sure he knew, right? He made sure Pharaoh knew, the Egyptians, the Israelites, and now it seems he made sure the people of Jericho knew. Uh, we heard it straight out of the mouth of Rahab. The people of Jericho had heard what God had done. Their courage had left them. Their hearts melted. Rahab herself recognized who God is. She said, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And after the spies returned to Joshua and told him, uh, truly the Lord has delivered into our hands all the land. For even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Joshua then prepares the Israelites to cross the Jordan and into the promised land. And this is Joshua 3, 10 through 17. Um, and Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, all the ites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man, and it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of their feet, or as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, it's reminding them again, um, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as they, they that bear the Ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all the banks at the, at the time of the harvest." that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even as the, or even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until... The people were passed clean over Jordan. So God kind of, before they go into the promised lands, so 40 years ago, God parted the Red Sea. And after the events of the Exodus, or after the events of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God kind of reminds them of what he did. He does it again. Um, not just for the Israelites, for the people in the promised land to see. 
um, but this is the next generation. They, uh, some of them might, were kids at the time when they went through the Red Sea. Some of them were not. Uh, some of them were born during the wanderings. But he's reminding them that he is the Lord and he can stop. He can do miraculous things. Uh, so God wants his people to remember this day. You may remember how quick the Israelites were to forget the Lord. Didn't take much time. Especially during the wandering. They just kept doing the same things over and over again, right? Uh, they were even told to pull out 12 stones, large stones. Uh, how large? Scripture says each tribe was to select a strong man to carry out a large stone out from the depths of the Jordan River. And they walked across on dry land. And they were to carry it on their shoulders. That's a pretty big rock. I think so. Um, so it was going to be a pretty big monument, 12 big rocks. And so, where was I? Uh, they were to build a monument for future generations to see and know what the Lord had done. So God even said that when you're, or it was in the book of Joshua, it says that when your children see this and ask, what is this? You can tell them, we pulled these out from the bottom of the Jordan when we walked across. Uh, so again, reminders of who God is and what he's done. Uh, so the miraculous crossing was not just for the Israelites to see and know. It was also a sign for the people in the promised land. You see, they had heard what God had done uh, for them in Egypt, how he parted the Red Sea, and they were guided through the wilderness 40 years by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That didn't stop after the Exodus. They were led by the pillars for 40 years, uh, for the 40 years they wandered. Uh, scripture says that when the uh, pillar moved, they packed up, they moved. Sometimes it was for a little while, sometimes it was for longer, but they moved when God told them to move. Um, so <clears throat> imagine, if you will, that you're the people in the promised lands, particularly the people of Jericho, looking out over their wall and seeing the pillar periodically move, followed by this massive crowd of people. And then one day, the pillar and the people turn and start heading towards you. You know what happened to Egypt, and Jericho is nowhere near as strong as Egypt. You're terrified already. And then the Jordan River stops up, and the people begin to cross over just like 40 years ago at the Red Sea. You think they knew it was going to happen? Yeah. Rahab said that all their courage left them. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a bit, because like I said, I'm going to be jumping around tonight, different stories, different events. But um, I'm going to jump ahead a bit to another story in the Bible that most people know, David and Goliath. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about the taunts that they yell at each other before David does his thing with the sling. Uh, most people are familiar with the story of David and Goliath, a battle of champions between a young man and a nine and a half foot tall giant. The stakes were high, the terms being if the Israelite champion won, the Philistines would be their servants. And if Goliath won, Israel would be the Philistine servants. Only the Philistines didn't expect the Israelites to win, and they clearly did not intend to honor the deal if they somehow pulled it off, and that after David won, they all took off running, only to be taken out by the pursuing Israelite army. Uh, but I want to look at the dialogue between David and Goliath as they meet on the battlefield. First Samuel chapter 17, we're going to be in verse 40 to 47. This is David. <clears throat> it says, And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare, uh, bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was a, but a youth, and ruddy, and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you come to me with, a, with staves? Like, am I a dog that you bring me a stick, right? Because um, David comes with a staff and a sling. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you, or come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from you, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." 
See, David was filled with and led by the Holy Spirit. He recognized that it wasn't just the Philistines versus the Israelites, but rather it was the Philistines versus the armies of the living God. In fact, when David first showed up to the fight, he asked the men around him, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I love how David completely turns Goliath's insults back on him and with the uh, no you. Uh, Goliath tells David what he plans to do to him, and David turns it around and says, no, that's what I'm going to do to you, and not just you, but your entire army and the whole world will know what God did here, that there's a God in Israel, and he fights for us. He saves not with sword and spear, more on that later, but he saves. The battle is the Lord's. This summer, I've been going through the book of Daniel, um, and it's amazing to me how God consistently uses Daniel and his friends in their Babylonian exile. Uh, Time and again, Daniel refuses to compromise and calls upon the Lord to help, and he delivers. And time and again, the kings of pagan nations end up glorifying the Lord or putting out a proclamation to honor the God of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar dreams a dream, and nobody can give him an interpretation, or even what the dream was, because he forgot it. Um, So Daniel and his friends pray, and God reveals to him the dream and its meaning, and Nebuchadnezzar responds by saying, he says, Of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Chapter 3, after God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, their houses shall be made a dunghill, Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Um, But it happens again with Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. In chapter 5, the queen refers to Daniel as a man in whom the spirit of the holy, uh, a man in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. So they recognize that he has uh, the authority of God. They don't fully understand exactly what it is. They're saying he has the uh, spirit of the holy gods. He's got the Holy Spirit in him. In chapter 6, after God delivers Daniel from the lion's den, verse 25, it says, Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which uh, shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of lions? So, peoples were saved, impossible odds overcome. Pagan rulers put out proclamations glorifying the one true God because God had done amazing things, and there is no one like him. Uh, These are the stories that people are most familiar with when it comes to Scripture. There are others, but these are just some that came to mind uh, and that fit the theme. And they all have a common theme, that God did these things, that the world may know that he is God. But there's another story. God did something even greater than all these. He sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, that our sin debt might be paid, that we may have eternal life in him. You see, these stories in the Old Testament, news spread far and wide because it was big news. This gospel we've been given is good news, or the good news. And God's given us a job to proclaim it, to tell the world what he's done for us, that the whole world may know that there is a God who loves us and died for us. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 is what's become known as the Great Commission. It's what Jesus commanded his disciples to do before he ascended up to heaven. It says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. You see, God desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. 
and praise God that he continues to call sinners to repentance. I want to wrap up with uh, Psalm 107. It's my favorite psalm, but I love the way it starts. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gather them out of the lands from east and from the west, from the north and from the south. That's everywhere. God calls people all over the world to come, to come to him, come to salvation, come be reunited to him through Christ. And he's a God who saves. Um, so I want to wrap up in prayer and then we'll move on to the next bit. But dear Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your promises, Lord, that you keep them. That you promise to send your son uh, way back in Genesis 3, Lord, after the fall. You promised to send a savior. And Lord, you did. Um, thank you, Lord, that you are a God that loves us enough to send your Son, that we may have eternal life in you, Lord, that the, uh, not just for some people, but, Lord, that you died for the sins of the world. While we were yet sinners, Lord, you sent your Son to die for us. So we are grateful for that. And, Lord, we pray that you would help us to recognize that more and more and give us the faith and opportunities to share your gospel to those around us that you've put in our path, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all that you do, all that you've done, Lord. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. peace for our transgression he was crushed for our sin the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds by his wounds we are here he was pierced for our transgression he was crushed for our sin the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. Amen. We are healed by your sacrifice and the life that you gave. We are healed. By your grace, we are saved, we are
He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice. And the life that you gave, we are healed for the price you paid. We are saved, grace be our saved. We are saved. 